In a typical uh, steam system, the steam is usually generated at high pressure in a, in a steam boiler, such as this. Um, and then that steam normally gets distributed to the plant where the steam is used to, for processing uh, whatever you're making, whether it be timber or tyres or just heating up water. In this instance, we have a, a steam boiler that's operating at 1000 kPa. And we're running along a main. Um, we've elected this uh, scenario to be about 60 metres of steam pipe from the boiler to the point of usage. And the point of usage is in this plant here, and it is actually only able to operate at 300 kPa. Uh, now, the reason you pressure juice is a number of reasons, but mostly it's to uh, uh, make it safe for pressure containment of lower pressure equipment so it doesn't explode. So you put a pressure reducing valve on the, on the pipework to make sure that the steam pressure uh, stays at the correct level for that particular piece of plant. In this case, we're going from 1,000 kPa to 300 kPa. The other reason you might pressure reduce is if the, the temperature a requirement on the product that you're heating is, is susceptible to high temperature damage, um, and you can control the temperature of the heating or the heat transfer surface by changing the pressure. In this case, a 1,000 kPa steam is uh, 184 degrees C. If you look at your steam tables, you can verify that. 300 kPa, the steam pressure is 144 degrees C. So there's a 40 degrees C uh, difference between the 1,000 kPa and the 300 kPa. So that, that's a couple of reasons why you might pressure reduce. To contain the pressure, to avoid an explosion, and to control the temperature to avoid damage to the plant. Now, another key reason for pressure reducing is, um, is to save cost. With 1,000 kPa, you have a certain specific volume uh, uh, equated to your steam, and at 300 kPa, you have a certain specific volume equated to your steam. If you refer to your steam tables, you will be able to see that, uh, that difference. In this case, what we've got is um, specific volume of 0.177232 cubic metres per kilogram. Again, refer to the steam tables. The steam tables are a very important part of pressure reduction and identifying what you need to do and how you need to do it. If you look at the 300 kPa, our, our uh, specific uh, volume is 0.460957 it's, uh, cubic metres per kilogram. It's almost uh, 2.6 times bigger uh, than the steam volume at 1000 kPa. So, if you take this scenario where we've got 60 metres of pipe, if we were to put our pressure reducing valve here, which you could do if you wanted to, and we could reduce our 1000 kPa down to 300 kPa and deliver steam through the process to the plant at 300 kPa, um, what would, two things would happen. First of all, you'd have your low temperature, sorry, your lower temperature, but higher specific volume um, of steam at this point where the PRV might be. And by doing that, you then would need to increase the pipe diameter to contain the larger specific volume. And if we look at our pipe sizing charts, I've sized this particular scenario based on an average velocity of about 25-30 metres a second, which is uh, reasonable for good steam fitting practice at 1000 kPa. And by doing so, it comes up with we need about a 50 nominal bore pipe for that uh, particular uh, size. That will be able to run at 1000 kPa all the way down to 60 metres of pipe to the point of usage where the PRV is installed. Now after the PRV at 300 kPa and the increased specific volume, we would end up with a size, again using uh, 25, 30 metres a second roughly, it's only a short run of pipe, uh, I've elected it to be about 6 metres of pipe, um, we would end up with an 80 mil pipe. 
So we've got a 50 mil here and an 80 mil nominal bore pipe uh, at the point of usage. The difference being that if we were to run 50 nominal bore pipe for 60 meters, it would cost X. But if we were with all the fittings and T's and other bits and pieces that might be in your piping system, um, we would run it at 50 diameter. If you had to increase those sizes up to 80 millimeter, everything would become more expensive. So the cost of running from your high pressure boiler to your point of usage would be exaggerated by using putting your pressure reducing valve too far away from the process. The closer you get it to the point of usage, uh, the more cost effective it is for the installation side of things. Um, when I was talking about um, uh, heat transfer, I think I mentioned heat transfer before, as well by reducing pressures or changing pressures, you have a difference in um, enthalpy of vaporization and there is more enthalpy available for use at the lower pressure than there is at the higher pressure. If you look at your steam tables, you'll see that um, the uh, 1000 kPa at 184 degrees C has an enthalpy of vaporization of 1999 kilojoules per kilogram. And at 300 kPa, it goes up to 2133 kilojoules per kilogram. So there's more effective enthalpy of evaporization for, for your uh, heat transfer process in your plant. Installing a PRV is not just a matter of throwing the PRV into a line and uh, expecting it to do its job. It, it will, um, but you won't know how to control it. You won't have any uh, bits and pieces to protect it, etc. So the, cor the correct type of installation, which we'll look at here, for that little PRV there would be something similar to this. What you might have is you have your 50 millimeter pipe work and all your ancillaries before the pressure reducing valve, you might have a separator with a trap set. Obviously you need an isolating valve so you can turn it off if you want to do maintenance, a strainer to protect it and a pressure gauge on the uh, upstream side of it so you can uh, know what the pressure is at the PRV. So it might be a thousand kPa here. If somebody has not sized the pipe correctly, you could have pressure drop and the resultant pressure could be less here. So a pressure gauge there just helps you to identify uh, what the pressure is at the control valve, at the uh, PRV. On the downstream side of any PRV, uh, depending on what's happening in your process, if it's a pressure containment issue uh, that you have uh, here, uh, then it is advisable that you have a safety valve installed after the PRV. The safety valve will then be set at a margin above the operating pressure of 300 kPa. And that way, if the, temp if the pressure tends to creep up and starts to get into the area where it might cause an issue with pressure containment in your heat transfer surface, uh, in your heat transfer apparatus, then the safety valve will go off and relieve pressure and it shouldn't blow up. So you, you, you would have a safety valve. It was just temperature related because there was a, a product issue. If it wasn't a significant issue to lose a bit of product, then you may not need the safety valve. Having said that, most people put PRVs, safety, sorry, safety valves after their PRVs uh, for both instances. Then, of course, you would obviously need, at the very least, a pressure gauge downstream of the PRV so you could set the pressure. If we didn't have that there, how would we know to set it at 300 kPa? I've seen quite a few installations where PRV is installed and no one really knows what's going on downstream here. So that's a typical PRV station and we can help design that and select all the bits and pieces for it if anyone ever needs any uh, guidance and advice on that. Now apart from that side of things, um, the installation of, of, of any PRV is, um, is a little bit special in itself. Now we've sized the pipe, we know that we've got 50 millimeter, 50 millimeter uh, on the upstream and 80 millimeter on the downstream. When we use these figures, 1000 kPa down to 300 kPa, 
and we've got, I don't think I wrote it there, this is basically sized on 1,000 kgs an hour. So the load going through this PRV is 1,000 kilograms per hour. And when I use these two figures, 1,000 kPa down to 300 kPa with a flow rate of 1,000 kgs, we came up with a 25 millimeter GP2000. Now that's a Yoshitaki uh, sizing chart and using their information, it comes up with a 25 millimeter GP2000, which is this particular valve here. It's a pilot operated valve, has a downstream sensor line, etc. Um, there are other types of PRVs on the market, but this one has a downstream sensor line. The other point to consider when installing this particular valve is that downstream sensor line, we recommend that they are about two metres long uh, and always fall in the direction of flow. And you need to get it into a, an area where there's low turbulence, a nice straight length of pipe would be good but the distance from the valve to where it can connect into your, uh, into your uh, pressure gauge set as well, if you wish. But into there, about two metres. Now, the GT2000 has come out of 25mm. We've got 50mm up, uh, upstream, 80mm downstream, and a 25mm PRV. This is how a, 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 a good installation should be done. And there's a couple of reasons for doing it this way. Main one is you want um, no restrictions in any way, shape or form collecting condensate as it enters the, the valve. This here shows you that there's a potential. If you don't have it flat on the bottom like this uh, eccentric reducer here and you have something like this, it's quite possible for condensate to build up uh, as it enters the PRV. If it builds up in there, it's going to get washed through your PRV and it's going to um, decrease the longevity of the, of the valve. Now, leaving the PRV is, is virtually the same. You don't want to collect condensate, so you can use a um, uh, concentric. As long as it drains away, uh, you can use flat on the top, eccentric, so it drains away. You just don't want any uh, form of... Uh, blockage at, at the exit point. But either one of those, concentric or eccentric, is okay. The main issue is, is having something not to uh, collect condensate entering the PRV. The amount of condensate that might get to this PRV would be limited if it was installed correctly in accordance with good steam fitting practice. As you can see, this line comes off the top of the pipe here, which is correct, drops down to the plant, um, and we have a steam trap assembly down here draining that line. So the good quality uh, steam comes off the, uh, off the side of the pipe and through the PRV and into the plant. Now depending on how close all this is um, and how many drain traps you might have along the way, being 60 metres, we probably should have another one in here. Every 25, 30 metres you should have a uh, drain trap assembly to collect any condensate that might be flowing along the pipework. So if this here is, is quite, quite close coupled and you've got a good drain trap assembly, you may not need your uh, separator set. Um, it all depends on your installation, but this is typical of what uh, you might need. Uh, you can even have bypasses around it. There's a few other uh, engineered parts that you can put into it if you desire. Okay, now we're going to talk about the actual pressure reducing valve itself. Uh, as you saw in the previous uh, uh, slide that we had up, uh, I said that we selected a 25mm GP2000. GP2000 is the Yoshitaki brand. That's one of process systems uh, supply. Um, and this is typical of what it might look like, uh, depending on what size you buy. Um, but they have some um, distinguishing features, which I'll just go through here which makes them a little bit different to other types of pressure reducing valves that may be on the, on the market. Uh, doesn't mean that the other ones won't do the job, this is just our Yoshitaki GP2000. The GP2000 is a self-acting unit, that means uh, you don't need any external source of um, motivation, either in pneumatics or electrics, to, to get it to operate. Um, it's pilot operated. 
Now, the self-acting and the polar operator can be identified in this area here uh, of the pressure-reducing valve. Basically, there's an adjusting knob on the top, uh, which you use a spanner to adjust, and you adjust that against the spring tension. Um, and that is how you will adjust your pressure up and down uh, due to the way the valve operates. Um, the pilot operated part is still in this area here. What you have is your downstream sensor line. We spoke about that in brief before, where you have to have your downstream sensor line about two metres long into the pipework. That senses the pressure downstream, and that comes into this port here. And when you've got a pilot valve arrangement up here, with a diaphragm, etc., and a spring tension on top, which you are adjusting with your spanner, and you've got your downstream pressure gauge that you're viewing, that spring tension against the opposing downstream pressure, balancing out against one against the other, is how you get to control your downstream pressure. So you put a certain amount of turns on that, it will allow it will allow um, steam through the pilot valve, which is coming in and makes its way up into this area, to go down through this control pipe assembly and underneath the main diaphragm. Now the main diaphragm, I'm probably jumping ahead a little bit, but I might as well talk about it now. The main diaphragm being a large area diaphragm means that uh, uh, once the steam gets down underneath, there's a lot of steam on a large surface area, and it pushes the push rod up and opens up the main valve and allows the steam to go down stream so you can start to see a rise on your, t on your pressure gauge up to your 300 kPa. Now, that you just continue to adjust that till you get your um, set point of 300 kPa where you want it. Uh, normally you set them against a, a running load because that's where your process is, is operating. Uh, sometimes you can't do that, you might have to set it against a uh, uh, a fixed load, but either way, once you get it up and running, it may be that you need to fiddle a little bit with that. But being self-acting, it basically is uh, ability to manually reset is, is quite functional. So that's roughly how, how the pilot operated self-acting GP2000 works. Now one of the good things about the, the Yoshitaki is that it has a good turn down, 20 to 1 turn down. Um, in this case, being a, a um, ductile iron valve, it will operate up to 2,000 kPa, and that means you can control pressure down to around about 100 kPa. Some other valves don't have quite as high a turn down, but the, the GP2000 does. The large main diaphragm, we spoke about that, and you need that to get uh, controllability over the valve. The bigger the diaphragm, the better the controllability over your downstream set pressure. Um, also able to open bigger valves so you get you know, higher capacity. High, the, the, all GP2000s have a high capacity for their size. And they have good controllability mainly because of that um, larger diaphragm. They're highly accurate. Once they're set, um, depending on the main, um, on your load and, and how your uh, loads and pressures may change um, in the boiler uh, and in the process. The uh, GP2000 has a, a, a very good ability to react to those changes quickly. Um, they have minimal offset of the set pressure. So when you've got a, a valve that's sized for a particular flow rate, it might be sized for a, a thousand kgs an hour, it might be able to do 1500, 1800 kgs an hour. You set it at 300 kPa and it'll be able to handle that load. But if the valve went from, uh, if for some reason the load went up uh, to its maximum output, the, the offset would be affected a little bit where you might have something like about 30 kPa maximum at maximum flow.